Alrighty. Tina koto kato, no mai hari mai, ko Charlotte Penton toko ungoa, ke kona moana fukoka aho e mahiana, he kai tohu tohu aho. Hello everyone and thank you all for being here today. My name is Charlotte Penton. I am a communications advisor at Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge. I'll be your facilita facilitator of this webinar today, which is our first for the year. Here in New Zealand, about 80% of our energy generation is renewable from hydro, geothermal and wind sources. However, as the recently released advice from the Climate Change Commission outlined just on the weekend, to decarbonise our future and to keep up with growing demand for electricity, our energy system needs to transform and become even more renewable. It's exciting to see a move towards wind and solar. But what about energy in the oceans? While tidal energy technology is becoming more established around the world, one major barrier to industry investment in tidal current energy is lack of knowledge about the scale of investment required. Is it worth it? So today's webinar is about our Energy from Tidal Currents project, which was through our innovation fund in our last phase of research. It looked into the potential of tidal current energy here in New Zealand and looked at the fundamental groundwork and information needed before it can happen. This question of is it worth it needs to be answered before deeper assessment occurs and before the steps of resource consenting, environmental impact assessments, maintenance costs, social license happen. This research is about the first step. So I'm pleased to introduce you to our speaker today, Ross Fennell. He is a physical oceanographer with over 25 years experience. He is coastal and ecosystems team leader at Cawthron and he also has been part of Team New Zealand a long time ago as the team oceanographer. He has worked on projects to produce highly detailed measurements of tidal currents and remote ocean sensing by satellite. And his current passion is quantitative ocean, quantifying ocean connectivity with computer modeling. And in fact, many of you may have seen him before. He has been involved in our ocean plastic tracker and has given webinars on that before too. Today, however, Ross will be talking about the tool that the project team has developed that can carry out rapid initial assessment of a site and farm sizes with Cookstrait as a case study. Before I hand over to Ross, here are some housekeeping about Zoom and the session. For your screen setup, we recommend a side-by-side -side mode. So to access this, move your mouse to the top of the screen, click on view options and select side-by-side. -side. We also suggest having the chat window open so you can ask questions throughout the session. This is found at the bottom of your screen. Just click on the chat icon. Ross will present the research and results for about 20 minutes. Then we'll have about 20 minutes for q and I'll keep everyone on time because time is important. Some of you may be quite familiar with Zoom, but for those of you who don't know, there are a few different ways you can ask questions. You can raise your hand by clicking the hand icon in your chat panel. I will see you and I will unmute you so you can ask it in person. Also feel free to send your questions through via the chat panel. I will definitely be asking them at the end as in the Q&A session. All right, over to you, Ross. Well, well, thank you, Charlotte. And thanks everybody for being here today. It's a lovely day in Nelson. I hope it's as good a day everywhere else. Yeah, so what I talked about is, is about some Sorry, so, some work we've been we, we did around tidal energy, particularly focusing on Cook Strait, but in parallel that's developing a tool which enables people to rapidly assess a region for the best sites within that region which you might want to look at developing. So it's not obviously not, not just me, there's myself and several people from Cawthron and Net Ocean Solutions are involved in the project. So thanks to them for all their support. And yeah, so, so well, just to get started is, you know, why? <laughs> I mean, we, and, and if it, as Charlotte mentioned, at the, at the weekend we had the re release of the report on the 2020 draft advice from the Climate Change Commission, and just two little statements out of there where New Zealand's demand for electricity will increase, you know, with electric cars and all those sorts of things. So that's, 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 a, that's a clear, clear. And we also, we also need to expand our renewable energy generation. If we want to keep up with that increasing demand, as electric vehicles start to come onto onto the grid, because you know we at the moment only about very roughly a third of our energy is in electricity. The rest is in oil and diesel and heat 
And so as some of that oil and diesel gets transferred into electric cars, we're going to need more electricity. So, but we need to get more renewables. And if you look at one of the graphs from that report is that it's showing hydro is sort of tapped out and said, so we've developed most of the good sites. So as we go forward, it's, it, it, it's going to be fairly flat into the future, going into the future. The geothermals doing well, there's some potential for improvement, but again, we're probably, in terms of the good hot, hot, hot wet rock sites, we're probably getting to the limit of what we can do in that area. And then obviously on top of that, there's going to be wind. I mean, winds, there's plenty of there's areas for the growth for wind that could grow, and for solar, et cetera. But I want to talk about ocean energy. It's probably, if we want to look at vehicles, you know, 10, 15 years out from now, where we have a mostly electric fleet, we still need a lot more than what we, we need a lot more. So really we'll talk about sort of ocean energy, which is, you know, New Zealand's small in relation to its ocean area. So this vast area of ocean is, there are energy resources there that, and renewable ones we could tap into. So just to give a sort of a bit of a background, there are actually sort of four, at least four sources of ocean energy. The, the top, the first one's wave energy. That's just basically, this is a, this is one particular device. There are many of them. It's a, a long cylinder. It has with flexible joints where there's hydraulic rams at those joints which, uh, which the, where the flexing of this thing in the waves actually creates pumps fluid and through a generator. So that's one type of energy, that's wave tidal energy, wave energy. What I want to talk about is tidal energy, which is the second type, with the second type. I'll expand on that in a minute. But there are two other less common ones that people may not be aware of, which is ocean thermal, which is in the tropics where there's a large difference between the hot water at the surface of the ocean and a couple hundred, several hundred meters below, it's much cooler. You can actually literally run a heat pump off that to generate energy. That energy could be used to power a generator. In this particular case, I think it's India, it's actually being used for desalination to create fresh water. And paradoxically, the fourth one is the opposite of that. You can actually use the fact that fresh water at rivers, where that meets the ocean, you can actually use the osmotic pressure by separating the fr fresh water and salt water by a, a, a thin membrane, you actually get a pressure which can actually create a driver turbine. So there's actually Actually, it's quite a lot. They both have quite a large potential as well, but they're fairly niche, niche applications over in the tropics for, for thermal and in areas where you could potentially build some plant where a river meets the sea. So, but I'm really focused on tidal energy. So, one of the huge advantages of tidal energy is that's predictable because we, we can predict the tides years and decades in advance. So, you actually, so although when you know, it's like wind, Sometimes it blows, sometimes it doesn't. We don't, we know, don't know always where that's going to happen. With tides, we know exactly when it's going to happen. So that's good. That's one advantage to it. And actually, tidal energy comes in two flavors. It comes in sort of tidal barrage, which is where people, with this one scheme in France, we actually build a dam across the entrance to an estuary. And you actually, it's like, it's like a hydro, large hydro dam. You let the water go through the dam and generate electricity. Obviously, they have an, obviously an effect on the entire estuary that they might dam. So, and also on top of that, there are only a few places in the world where that's really useful because you need at least about five meters of tidal range. That's the difference between high tide and low tide, five meters. And there aren't that many places in the world. New Zealand, we average sort of one to three meters, depending on whether it's spring or deep tides, but for tidal range. So there's only a few places in the world where that's useful, like the Bay of Fundy, parts of France or whatever. Okay. So that, but there are many more places in the world where you have strong tidal currents. And that's the type of energy I'd really like, tidal, tidal energy I'd really like to talk about. So these are basically turbines under the water. So tidal turbines, uh, you've, roughly you can think about them as wet wind turbines. So, whereas, so these turbines here, like this one on the top left is one that was in, the, in Strangford, Lock and Ireland for about eight years. It's one of the very first prototypes. Got decommissioned, I think last year, a company with the year before after a long test period, but it's generating about a megawatt. A megawatt's a couple of hundred homes worth. So one of these could power a couple of hundred homes. The size of them, these blades are 15, 20 meters across in each of this case. So at 15 meters, you can generate a megawatt, which is the size of what would probably be called a moderate size wind turbine in this day and age. So whereas a moderate wind size wind turbine might have blades 100 meters across because it's operating in air and water, we get the same amount of energy out of 15 to 20 meters of diameter of blade. So it's because water is a lot denser. And there are numerous designs. There's sort of a, some that look like a airplane wings and air turbines, but other ones like this one, which is the open hydro one, which is kind of cool, specifically designed so that it can minimize the potential impact on marine mammals. So, but it looks more like the front of a jet engine, if you know what I mean. 
the ones at the bottom are really interesting. I didn't actually put this in the slide, but Charlotte did, and I'm really glad she did. <laughs> because if we had Cook, if we did this in Cook Strait, this would be the perfect model for us because it's in much deeper water. We're talking waters to 50 to 100 meters. And that technique might be we would moor them on the bottom, and then as the current runs, that runs that way, they'll generate power. And when the current turns around, they'll flip over and go the other way. So if we were talking about Cook Strait, they might look more like this, sort of turbines that are moored sort of below the surface of the way from ships, but so they can flip-flop as the current comes and goes. So cool. So why is a why is New Zealand why is um Cooks why is New Zealand such a great place for energy from tidal power? Well, the first thing is tidal phase distribution. That's a mouthful. I'll explain it in a minute. Look, okay, okay. So this is a an animation developed by model from Neva, which I stole a long time ago. Well, it's probably on their website somewhere. But New Zealand has some really weird tidal patterns, and they're really cool. This is, this actually animation is showing that the high tides are red and the the low tides are blue. And as an oceanographer, we don't think of the tides as something that ebbs and flows. We think of it as a wave. It's actually a wave propagating around the world. And, and those waves bounce around the ocean. And those bouncing around in our particular area produce this, this pattern where the actually the tide, the high tide and low tide, chase each other around the country at 300 kilometers an hour. Okay, And so that, people say that's a bit weird. How can the tide go at 300 kilometers an hour? It does. That's very different. The water obviously isn't moving at 300 kilometers an hour. You definitely know that it was true, <laughs> but it's, it's, a diff it's something you're probably already aware of in some sense that if you watch a stick in the water as the waves go by, the wave crests go by really fast, but the stick itself moves back and forth a little bit in the, in the currents associated with the wave. Just in this type of wave, that gets magnified really up so that although this wave, there's high tide and low tide are flipping around the country. And just to be clear, the reason this happens is that it's due to the Earth's rotation and the Coriolis effect. The Earth's rotation which actually creates this bizarre pattern. And it, it, the actual water is moving much slower than the actual crest and trough. And said, so there's only one other place on the world where this happens, it's Madagascar. And so phase distribution just means that everywhere, if you think about it, anywhere in the New Zealand coastline, there's, there'll be a high tide or a low tide at the same time and everything in between. So if you imagine if you had a tidal generation in the North Cape, it will generate at a different time from tidal generation in, this, in down in Bluff. So the cool thing about this is that it, although it, we know exactly when it's going to be produced, but all these different schemes can produce at different times, sort of evening out that production. So that's one major advantage. And the only other place on the planet that I know of that has it is Madagascar. And Madagascar doesn't have Cook Strait through the middle of it. And that's really what I want to talk about. Cook Strait, the number there is huge. It's 15,000 megawatts. To put that in context, that's the upper limit. I'll talk about it. And I need to say that a little bit quietly because I don't want people to walk away thinking that's what we're going to get. Because for practical reasons, we can only get a small fraction of that. But, the, but because we've got such a high potential, getting a small fraction of 15,000 is a big number. So 15,000 in terms of scale is two New Zealand's worth of electricity at the current point. So twice what we currently use. That 15,000 is actually only the average. At peak flows, it'll be more like 35,000. Okay, so big numbers. To put it, but you know, so that putting in a scheme that might get 1,000 would be on the plot, it would be quite, be quite reasonable and plausible sometime in the future. And 1,000 is would power in Auckland, and 1,000 would power TY Point. And that's our largest current power station is Manapuri at about 700, 800. So getting to it, that so it would actually a cook 1,000 megawatts out of Cook Strait would be a, bigger than we have now, but making a really big contribution to the country. And the reason that Cook Strait's so good is that if you think about this picture on the left, the actual high tide, when there's high tide at one end, it's actually low tide at the other at the same time. So you've basically got this big seesaw motion driving strong currents back and forth through Cook Strait. And again, a picture I sold from, from, from Niwa a while ago, just showing an animation of what the currents might look like in Cook Strait. So you've got these very strong flows because you've got this high tide at one end, low tide at the other, alternating, pumping a seesaw, pumping water back and forth through Cook Strait. And the flows are very strong. What makes Cook Strait so good is they're very strong. There are other places in the world where stronger flows, but they're strong over a large area. That's what makes it so good. And so what we're trying to work on is that we've done, you know, me and others have done sort of back of the envelope calculations of how much energy you get out of Cook Strait. This work is really about trying to get that down to nuts and bolts. How much can you get from certain amount of turbines is a much more interesting and useful question to answer. So Cook Strait's great because we all know it's got big waves, you know, but it also got really strong tidal currents. 
And pretty quickly, as you'd probably guessed, with some we looked at various sites around Cook Strait, it came down to focusing on what we call Cape Terrafiti, the bottom left corner of the North Island, which also happens to have the West Wind, wind Farm on it, which I'll talk about more later. So right next to there, there's a, a very good tidal energy current in terms of current, current resource. And I'd argue it's probably the best place in the world you know, on some level. You know? so, that's, so we narrowed the focus on Cape, Cape Terrafiti. So but just thinking about it, so if you want to develop a tidal turbine farm, it's, it's, it's much because it's, it's, it's nice to put a turbine in, but you need hundreds to be useful. That's really what it comes down to. So that's really what this work about is, how do we scale up to hundreds of these things? And what, what might you get from hundreds rather than one? So this, the first obviously aspect is there's lots of engineering, design, manufacturing, getting the, and the UK is really leading the, leading the way on this. There's lots of work around assessing the environment of impacts, making sure they can actually minimize the impact on the environment and through underwater noise with acoustic, acoustic noise for marine mammals, change centrification, changes in flow, all of those things that go with, you know, we don't get nothing for free, think will cause call, call some changes, but there's lots of work there. But what we're really focused on, the question you need to ask before those two questions are, do you, what, what, what you need first is, what you need to know first is, is it worth it? So trying to get a very, a sense of how much power, how much, and what sort of economics it might have was really the sort of a, a preliminary focus of this work, going beyond the sort of back of the envelope calculations that people have done to a much more sophisticated approach. So the question is really, how much power can we get from a certain number of turbines at the site? And you don't know how many turbines you need until you put them on the site. So we use computer models to put lots of, test lots of scenarios of 10, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 turbines, getting absolutely ridiculous in cases just to see you know, what, what we might get, because we, in the virtual world, we can play with what we like. So the, the, the part of the reason, as we think about this, is that if we have um, one turbine, there's something like the CGN, it's a powers one to 200 homes, might give you a megawatt. We actually need to move from those, to get to, to be useful to New Zealand Inc., we need to develop to hundreds and thousands. Okay, so the question is how much you get from hundreds? So. A very quick question, I normally ask this when I'm in a, in a room, I can get people to feedback on it, but I'll sort of answer the question myself when I, answer, when I after I posed it, is, you know, if you put 101 megawatt turbines into a given area, will it give 100 megawatts of power? So is 100 times 1 100? And you probably guessed me answering that question as, no, 100 times 1 is not 100. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's not the way it works in physics. It may work in math, but it doesn't work in physics. And the reason for that is that when you take energy from the flow, you actually start to put a little drag on it. And any one turbine doesn't do much to slow the flow. But if you've got hundreds of them, you actually stop, start slowing the flow that's going through the farm. So, oops, it's a bit hard to, sorry. So, so, to, so the, it turns out the answer to my question I'm gonna answer myself is 100 times one is sometimes less than 100 if you're in small channels, but bizarrely in some channels it can be more than 100, even though you're slowing the flow. You can still get more than 100, 100 megawatts at 100 turbo, one megawatt turbines. And I'll explain a little briefly why that is on the next slide. So it's just a, it's a way, it's something to do with large turbine farms when you put them in channels. So if you think about a very simple graph of this axis, I put the number of turbines, and the green line is how many turbines I get. It's just a straight line that goes up. The more turbines in it, the more it goes up. But as I said, as you put more turbines, you create more drag. So that as you create that drag, some of the flow that was going through the farm giving you energy is forced around the farm by that drag. So that actually the farm, water air, the current going through the farm, which is the stuff that's creating the energy, goes down. So as you put more turbines in, the current goes, the actual current speed within the farm goes down. So that there's sort of a, there's an optimization problem here, which is this, it's, it's, which makes this an actually quite a, an interesting and fun problem. And, difficult problem to solve is that basically you put one turbine in, you get a bit more, you get a bit more, but as you put more and more in, you start to reduce the flow a little bit, then a little bit more, a little bit more. And so you start to the point where you add turbines and you don't get any more. So you get to this maximum. And after that, if you put more turbines in, you actually get less power. So there's actually an optimization problem that has to be done in order to try and figure out what's that optimal number. So that it, so farm power is a, ends up being a product, three factors. One is the number of turbines, which is obvious, is also a factor of the current speed. And it's very sensitive to speed in the sense that it's actually the current speed cubed. So that means that if I double the current, I double the current speed in the area, I actually get eight times as much energy out of it. So it's very sensitive. So I've changed the current a little bit, it makes a big difference to the power. So these changes in currents due to the turbines actually have an effect. And the third part is the sufficiency factor, is that it turns out that in some channels, 
putting them like like cook straight, the more you put in, the actually you can make them more initially you can actually make them more efficient. So there's a it's actually it's kind, of, it's kind of cool. So there's actually three factors, but I'll talk mainly about the current speed effect. Right. So what we've been doing is trying to use the hydrate model to sort of quantify that output. And we specifically honed in on these three sites. This is the water depth in Cook Strait off Cape Terrafitti. There's Wellington on the top right here. You know. So, and we chose these three sites in, a, in a, an order of interest of A, B, and C. And see, the water depths are not small. They're up 200 meters out here. And they were talking about these farms are in water sort of 50 to, you know, 20 to 80, 80 meter water depths. So if we just look at the maximum, we chose these spots because they had really strong currents. So at uh, site A, we've seen currents in excess of two meters a second. And two meters a second is four knots if you're nautical or seven kilometers an hour. But in person speak, that's the world record pace for 200 meters by an Olympic swimmer in a short race is around, it's just over two meters a second. Okay, so, you know, we could not, none of us more mortals could swim against that. Is that in fact we probably me I probably struggled to get half a meter per second. <laughs> so there's no hope in here because we got the sort of currents that you can see at site A, which is lousy if you're a cross cook tray cook straight swimmer, and there have been a few of them with swim across cook straight, but it's really good if you're about talking about tidal currents. And so I A looks the best, B followed by B and C. And the reason they're there is actually you've got this very high flows from that seesaw going past Cape Terrafitti, combined with actually there's some underwater ridges or spurs that sit out sit, head out from Cape Terrafitti to actually accelerate the flow in those patches. So it's actually quite a subtle question. It's not so, oh, there's currents everywhere. It's actually, there's actually quite specific, really good spots and if we and to start with. And so we've investigated these as sort of the, if you're gonna go for the first spot, A is, a is your spot. Okay. So part of that process is to do hydrodynamic modeling. And what we basically do, we get create a virtual model of Cook Strait, which is breaks the, straight in this in this blue region up to about 100,000 different little triangles. We basically have the tide going up and down in the, in the virtual the virtual tide going up and down at this side and up and down on this side. And that literally drives the currents back and forth cook straight inside the model, which is solving the rules of physics. So it gives you sensible flows. But there's a technical challenge in all of that is that we can't, that running that model might take minutes to hours or days, depending on how you run it. So the, the problem is we don't have to run it once because for every farm we choose, we want to have to optimize the power from that farm. And then we want to explore hundreds of examples of farms. So we need to, that's the technical challenge. How do you do that fast enough? So there's a bunch of techniques we used to do that. I won't go into detail here, but one of the important ones, we were trying to make sure that we actually tuned up the farm to get the maximum out of that farm for each, in each individual of these hundreds of cases that we looked at, different sizes and shapes and numbers of turbines. So when I say we've developed a rapid tool, it's not that rapid from a from a more, it's actually doing the computation in days, not months. That's really, that's what we consider to be rapid in this example. Right, so just where are the best examples? So well, as I indicated, if you've put, if you just block, if you just put a single turbine out there on all, all that's a little lonesome, this is sort of the power you might get out of what might be a one, me, a, a one megawatt rated turbine, but you can actually probably if it's strong enough. You could get out to a megawatt and a half out of it at site A, the small area at B, and slightly lower values at C. So, yeah, so let's say if you put a lone turbine out there, but let's say, who cares? A low turbine's interesting. If we put a one megawatt turbine into somewhere like Stewart Island, they'd be really happy because that's almost enough to power every home on the, almost power most of the homes on Stewart Island. It wouldn't power most of the homes on Stewart, um, North Island. So we need hundreds of these things. So, but of course, when we do that, we actually, we actually um, change the flows a bit. And this figure is just indicating that, yeah, as we put more up to 90 turbines in this area at A, if you, the area downstream, when the flow goes this way and downstream this way, when the, actually the flows get reduced as you go through the farm, they get accelerated around the edges a little bit as that gets, uh, flow gets uh, um, forced around the farm by the fact that we're taking energy from that little area. So it's a, bit, it's a balancing act between you're actually, you're actually trying to balance how much flow goes through the farm, how much goes around the farm with how much power you actually get out of the system. So, but those, in this case, you know, we're talking about a 90 turbine farm. In a world sense, that's massive. There are f the farms out there are barely in the handfuls at the moment. But for Cook Strait, a massive farm would be 
thousands of turbines. This, we're, so, we just, so, but in this initial instance, it looks like that something of a scale of 100 would be quite a good solution in the, in the very near future. So a bit of a technical slide, but I just want to give you just a sense of what we're trying to do here is that if you've, we've plotted lots of examples, different numbers of rows of turbines. And so, so if you just look at this blue line, that just shows if you had one row of turbines at A, is extended further and further out, it'll, it, gets, it, gets, it gets more energy. But then once it gets too far out, it starts to get into some of those weaker flows and deeper water. So it actually starts to taper off a bit. Okay. And if, if you look at, and, but it's not just a matter of how much power you get out of the array as a whole. It's actually look, important to look at how much you get out of each turbine, which is what the picture on the right is about. So out of that, each turbine there is producing up to 1.2 megawatts. But as it gets bigger and bigger, it actually starts to fall off. So it's actually a bit of a trait. There's balance here. We're trying to get the most power out of the fewest turbines. So that's why, so, so, and so the best compromise we can sort of see at the moment is something like a two row farm generating about, with 90, around 90 ish turbines and about 90 ish, 100 ish megawatts, that sort of scale, which is that sort of dot. When each turbine's producing around that megawatt, which is sort of the scale of what 20 meter turbines can do right now. Okay. So that's sort of our sort of a, a useful sort of starting point for thinking about a, a a reasonable size farm. So there, so it's 95 turbines spaced 100 meters apart in two rows, around about 90 megawatts. So yeah, that's a couple, a couple one to 200 sort of homes worth of electricity at site A. To put that in context, West Wind, which is happens to be right next door to where I'm talking, is the wind farm which powers Wellington. It's sort of like the 140 megawatt to 70,000 homes sort of scale. So sort of what we're talking about is a sort of a, a tidal energy equivalent of West Wind Right, almost next door to it. Right. So just a quick reminder that so that if we if you develop site A, that reduces the currents in A, but actually downstream of A when the flow goes this way. So in fact, if you somebody want to come on after the develop B or C later on, they're going to feel the effects of A depending on how big A is. So we did a small exploration of just how much. So if you look at the effect of A on B, it's not that much, maybe a couple of percent. Those farms that he's talking about. It doesn't, so there's obviously because B is quite a long way from A and the flows have had time to mix up and recover before they get to B. We're talking about C though, I mean, C would be significantly affected by moderate or very large farms by 10 or 15%. So the important question about this is that you can't just go into an area and say, I will acquire this site, you can acquire that site, and we'll go off and do our own thing. You actually have to do it together and cooperate because you affect each other. And just to be very clear that I'm not promoting, I'm not develop, I'm not going to be out there developing farms. This work is just really about providing that foundation for people who might want to come in later, thinking it's a very the sort of improved back of the envelope calculations would encourage them to put in the, the hard work which you need to investigate site A, B, or C in the future. Right, so the key takeaways. So the the this is a tool that can rapidly assess a potential site. So specifically, if you're looking at a large region, which sites within there, what farm sizes might be useful, and can we rapidly work out work that out? So you can actually then do think about well, okay, these are the goods one might initially be useful. And then you do the detailed environmental and engineering work and other and, and oceanographic measurements and all that kind of stuff to, to confirm that that's see to confirm that those those ideas about that site are good. Initially, it looks like. Site A is sort of a, a good a good start point. 95 turbines, 20 meter in diameter. They exist already. Those turbines, spaced about 100 meters apart in two rows. We did some very rough economics. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> and just to show that it's, that's not quite economic now, but it just needs a you know 10, 15, or whatever percent, 20 percent direct reduction in the costs by manufacturing these turbines in big factories and assembly lines, or if the cost of energy goes up. It could be close to being economic, not that far in the future. So that's kind of that was that was actually quite a surprise to me that we that we're not it's not economic now, but it, you know a few years from now it could well be economic. And to go further than that, we're going to need to get turbines which will extend further into Cook Strait. They're going to need to operate in lower flows. So if we want to go beyond this sort of 195, so 195 megawatt scale. We're going to have to move. Get, we have to, new technologies are going to need to be physically bigger turbines, which are able to efficiently extract energy from the weakest rows that are offshore in the middle of Cook Strait. But once we do that, we can really start thinking about scaling beyond to 100, to 200, to 300, to 400, and get get to my my dream. Because I mean, my dream is that sometime in the future I'll be sitting, I'll be I'll be hovering in a helicopter over Cook Strait and saying yes. <laughs> but you know, 
we can all wait. I'm a, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it's something we could, it has the potential. Thank you. So yes, I just write this. The paper, yeah, the, with this, this is a publication, and it's, and it's been the reference etc. in the DOI is there if people want to look at it at some point. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ross. That was fascinating, um, and I'm very pleased to say we have quite a few questions coming through already. Um, so I, in this order. As they came through, I will go Christo, Alex, Emily, Gemma, and then Gaia. And everyone feel free to add your questions as Ross is answering. I'll try and get them all. Okay, Ross, this is from Christo. What numerical model slash package was used and which boundary conditions were used to force the model, e.g. TPXO 8.0 or the NIWA model? Uh, uh. <laughs> I, I should be asking Brett and Remy, and Remy Met Ocean. Go, Met Ocean developed the model. They've got various ways of doing those boundary conditions. So, yeah, that's, yeah. But we focus only on the tidal part of those boundary conditions because that's that's what we were focusing on. So, yeah, that's a bit of an evasion. I don't actually have a clear, I don't know all of the details in my head. I don't have all the details in my head of that. Um. Christo, I recommend you check out the paper, which I will be sending through um, a link to uh, at the end of the webinar. All right, so next up, we have a question from Alex Thompson. Are there any significant environmental impacts of reducing the flow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, I did. it obviously depends how much, but yes, you know, the, the farms we're talking about are pretty minor. There's probably not much, much effect, but in some situations, if you reduce the flow significantly, you'll change, obviously, sedimentation. If you're doing this in places where the, the system, the bottom is mobile or made of sand, that may change the geomorphology a little bit and those sort of things. So, yeah, there are, yeah, there are potential impacts. Yeah. In Cook Strait, where the flows are massive, the bottom's got quite a few boulders on it. It's, it's less of an issue, but, okay. yeah. Cool. I just want to jump in there and just remind everyone that um, this research specifically looked at the modelling, so it did not look at all the other things, including environmental impacts, um, consenting, all that information you need for this. Well, that's, that's obviously very, very important aspect. So if this is just a, back, it's a, a much better than back of the envelope calculation of working at, is it worth even starting that process? Because yes. if it's not, it's not enough, if not enough likely to be enough energy source there, you know, you don't want to be, you need to, put, you, you, we may not start, but if you think it is, you'll, you're going to go to that next level of assessment, which is, one of those important environmental engineering considerations. Yes, absolutely. All right, so thank you, Ross. Okay, next question is from Emily Lane. Was the wind farm output number of 140 megawatts the peak or average power output? And how does tidal compare to wind over longer periods? It, um, for example, windy or calm periods and spring neap cycles? Yeah, well, so yeah, so it's a, I mean, in our model, we only, to make things faster, we only got an average tide, but we could certainly expand that out to look at the full spring leaf cycle at, at, at a cost of doing more time. So, yeah, I mean, they're, they're both variable. They both vary over spring leaf cycles. I, you know, I can just, I can, but I'm, I can imagine in the future that I, I'm like sitting there, sitting, sitting my washing machine or dryer by the, by the time of the tides, because that's when the power's cheap. <laughs> you know what I mean? But so, it's so, yeah, they're, they're just, they're just different animals. Though, but so, the tidal, you know, wind, wind is variable. We have some idea a few days out in terms of weather, what we might be getting in terms of weather prediction. The main difference with the tidal is that we can do that prediction years in advance. So, you know, exactly, you know, you know, but you know to the, you know to the minute probably when it's, when you're going to get the maximum power. Great. Thank you, Ross. Okay. Next question is from Gemma. Are there opportunities to pair tidal energy turbines with other ocean ventures such as aquaculture or offshore wind, et cetera? Oh, absolutely. Because I mean, yeah, I mean, if I was looking at New Zealand Inc., is that the next step after onshore wind will probably start looking seriously at offshore wind. And then if, you, if those offshore wind sites happen to be in Cook Strait, yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? We can, we can do something, and we can, you know, can potentially build a joint structure. So that's good. In terms of aquaculture farms, the sort of sites we're currently targeted at two plus meters a second are probably not the, the easiest aquaculture sites <laughs> in terms of keeping this, their structures in place. But in terms of a smaller scale, absolutely, you could, you know, 
generate smaller and smaller smaller scales smaller scale production so yeah awesome oh oops sorry my zoom just <laughs> disappeared all right next question is from gaia are there any is there any knowledge or studies on the impact on wildlife, both for modifying the flow, but also for potential collisions with the turbines or other impact on pelagic animals? Well, so. been, the UK and the various other places have been very, very careful and sensitive. Like that, that strength and lock one, they, were, they happened to be in a, a channel where um, sea, sea seals were, go, were swimming through to look into the lock. And they were very obviously concerned that the seals would come in contact with those rotating blades. And when they started out, they actually had to, a person standing there to turn it off. A seal came to nearby. They eventually moved to a acoustic system for doing that so they could turn it off. But it turns out the seals in this case worked were pretty smart. They went on the other side of the channel. But, you know, there's certainly been a lot of work in the UK around those issues, which are, you know, which absolutely have to be addressed. Great. Thank you, Ross. All right. Next question is from Kathy Fletcher. Ooh, where it's disappeared. Did the study or did the research project um, seek input from Māori scientists and or discuss Te Mana o Te Moana? Yes, it had a, had a small component. We had Kenny was on our team. She conducted a bunch of interviews around the place, just to, not necessarily to focus on saying we're going and develop this thing, but just to get some people's views and understanding of one of, of that area and you know what, what were traditional uses of that area, particularly around Cape Terrafiti. I think the main concern that was brought up was not necessarily the what's happening in the ocean is that the onshore operations might affect Urupa or et cetera, but maybe around that area. And that was obviously, a, you know, you would not want to go anywhere near those. Yeah. So, so, so I was more, the, the main concern that we, we heard was, one of the concerns we heard was around that, not necessarily what happens on the water, but what could might be on the onshore structure in terms of bringing cables ashore and all those kinds of things. Yeah, kia ora. thank you, Ross. Okay, my next question is from Chris Mitchell. Wind farms are often shut down when the airflow is too strong. Does this happen with tidal turbines? Well, that's actually one of their advantages is that we pretty much know what the maximum is going to be so we can design for it. It's, and it's, it's, and it, it doesn't go much, the maximum's not going to be much more. We know what the worst spring tide of the years of, of the decade is going to be because we can predict it. So that's the advantage. You actually never a narrow design envelope for the upper end. So yeah, we, Certainly, you know, so if you can design for that upper end, you wouldn't need to, as you see, feather the blades or that which happens, which happens with wind turbines. So, yeah, so there's another slide, another advantage there. Awesome. Okay, I also have a question for you, Ross. Um, so last call for questions. While I'm asking mine, please send yours through on the chat. Um, if I was a developer, a wind, uh, tidal turbine wind developer wanting to use your model, how can I access it? Well, actually, the first thing is to talk to us because the basics of what, what you need to sort of make the stuff, you need a hydrodynamic model and Net Ocean built that for, for this as part of this team. They're, they're, they're fabulous at developing these virtual height models of the ocean. But there are certainly other people out there who do that kind of work. That's the first step. And then it's a matter of working, uh, working with us to potentially wrap around this tool around that to actually do this optimization and do all these trials. So yeah, we'd be happy to work with people who want to do that. Awesome. All right. Next question is from Daniel Rexon. What's your guess when New Zealand will see a trial realized? <laughs> well, I was guessing 10 years, 10 years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> good. Yeah, it's got, and uh, many, probably several in the room have been a part of Awatea, which is the uh, Aotearoa Wave and Tidal Energy Association. And that's really been the, the dream is to get, uh, so get both wave and tidal devices as at least experiment as, as initial ones in the water. So I'm, I'm not going to put a day on it. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. I hope that answered your question, Daniel. Next question is from Nio Fulton. Does the Bets limit apply to the efficiency of underwater turbines as it does to wind turbines. Yeah, I wrote a paper about this one, <laughs> sadly, which is how you can exceed the bets limit for tidal turbines. <laughs> the answer right. is, that sounds really cool because in, in, in wind turbines, the bets limit is that's it. You can't go any more beyond it. But what's different about these tidal turbines in channels is that when you put them in channels, they get more efficient because you're actually putting a duct around them. 
effectively. And and it doesn't and even if you're only occupying five or ten percent of the, the channel width, you start to have to see that effect. That she said that's what that's what I meant when I talked about efficiency several slides back, is that's one of the efficiencies that comes in, is that the extra turbines get more efficient as you start putting the more of them in initially. Not if, but so yeah, so yes, the bets limit does apply, but you have to rethink what it is because the bets limit for these things actually the actual limit is, is higher than if, if you're if you're in a channel and it happens to be a channel like Cook Strait. Yeah. Awesome, that has gone completely over my head, but okay. thank you for answering that. <laughs> it's not, it's not um, those things that people, you know, I mean, the, the holy grail of wind turbines is to get close to the bets limit, and. Here it's a bit of a cheat because we're putting them in. It's like if you put a whole lot of wind turbines in a in a canyon and put a roof on it, they become more efficient. You need to go past the normal bets limit. Okay, thank you, Ross. All right, next question. Are in a channel, <laughs> canyon with a roof on it. Great. Next question is from Emily. Oceans are harsh environments for structures with moving parts. True. Mm -hmm. What is the life of most turbines? Is there maintenance needed and how is it performed? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, the cool thing about, you know, what one positive spin off is fossil fuel industry is that they've got a long history of putting things in the ocean and keeping them going for a long time. Things like the CGN turbine was in for eight years. It was specifically designed to lift up and down so they could actually perform maintenance. The ones I was talking about for Cook Strait would be those floating underwater ones. You'd actually design them so they could be popped to the surface and taken away and taken home for service and, and came back and they can more more than back again later when you when they've been fixed. So yeah, they're gonna need maintenance like anything. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Ross. I guess um in terms of the research you did and the turbines you looked at, you didn't did you look at a particular style? No, I mean, we, we just sort of came up with a sort of what we think is the the best, the best sort of biggest turbine, which is something around equivalent with equivalent of a 20 meters of air, 20 meter diameter. The CGN has that split across two different rotors. So just we're talking about the, the basic characteristics of the, the largest turbines that exist at the moment. So in a generic sense, yeah. Okay, great. All right, and I've got my last question from Arnold. If everything went the right way, when would you expect to be pleased with your helicopter survey over Cook Strait? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's hard. It's, I, I don't expect it to be honestly in, in the near future because New Zealand has a lot of, you know, got offshore wind to tap. It's when we start getting to the end of those things, we'll start to look at these, more thinking about large scale development. But the, the issue is that we need to have work done now because it takes a decade, a decade or more to sort of develop technology and experience so you can actually start to scale. So again, I don't, I'm not putting a number on it, but again, New Zealand has opportunities here, not just to meet our own needs, but you can imagine if we can turn, if we had an excess of renewable, we could be turning it into high value products, high value energy dense projects, products like silicon and those sorts of things. So it's sort of beyond, so there's, a, I mean, you know, imagine selling green silicon for computer chips as opposed to silicon silicon made from fossil fuels, if you know what I mean. So those sorts of things. So yeah, I'm not putting numbers on it, but you have to keep plugging away at these things because mm -hmm. there's decades, there's a decade or more or two of lead time to start getting these things where actually people start to take notice and then suddenly they want it yesterday. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Ross. Um, I think this is a great place to wrap up the webinar. Um, it's a lovely, lovely um, piece of information to end on. Um, thank you, everyone. And thank, thank you, you, Ross, so much for speaking to this research. It's um, The project was finished a couple of years ago, and it's really great to sort of wrap it up. Um, I would just like to remind everyone that this webinar has been recorded and will be made available online in about 24 hours or sooner. I will send around an email to everyone registered so you have the link. I will also include links to the paper and some of the other resources mentioned, such as links to the Climate Change Commission's um, advice for consultation. It's really interesting, especially in the energy pages. Um, highly recommend checking that out. And keep your eyes peeled for announcements for more upcoming webinars. We do have some in the works. We are just organizing and finalizing the details of those. So again, thank you all and thank you very much, Ross. This has been great. Well, thank you, Charlotte, for organizing all this and making sure it ran really smoothly. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.